Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today is a very special episode because I will be interviewing a pioneer among pioneers in the world of independent cinema going back to the... Probably, he was probably around the late 60s, but the 70s is when he really hit his stride. William Sachs, the director of The Incredible Melting Man, Galaxina, Hot Chili, Van Nuys Boulevard. Hell, he even co-produced the first Leprechaun movie. And we're going to be interviewing him today. I can't believe it. The man is just a legend. I want to find out about the independent uh, film scene of uh, the 70s, you know, I mean, I, I already know it was over, it was just Roger Corman based, you know, br- breaking even, making money that way. You know, the independent uh, film scene was not like it became in the 90s when, when independent films started, like, making huge box office numbers. But I want to find out about what the scene was uh, back then, and it's going to be pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with William Sachs. Hey, are you ready? Yeah, sorry. Neighbors escaped dog while retrieving it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Damn dogs. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. You can't schedule those things. Yeah, you can't schedule those things. Uh, well, it's, it, I'm here. Well, it's, it's such an honor, sir, because I've always thought of you as a pioneer of independent film, and I appreciate you taking the time today. <laughs> Pioneer, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Mostly because I guess I like to do what I want. Mm-hmm. Other people want me doing whenever I do something that someone else wants me to do, I don't like it. <laughs> well, they're idiots. There are a few out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did you uh, fall in love with uh, film early on? Hello? Hello? You back? Yeah. Sorry, my, my cheek hit the muting thing up. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, what I, that's my Anyway, no, when I was a kid, you know, I escaped to the movie theater on Saturday afternoon about movies and see all kinds of fun things. Like, I'm sure it's nice, like the horror things and, you know, just fun. And mm-hmm. I guess that got me hooked. And we used to go to drive-ins. They don't have them anymore, I guess, but that was fun, too. So I think it was a fun experience. And, and um, I always wanted to be a writer. When I was four years old, but or fourth grade, and I, started, I wrote something about my mother giving the puppy away with the relatives, but still, I wrote this short story in school that went in little grammar school paper, and I got a lot of attention, so this is good. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in high school, I got picked for a creative writing class, which they were experimenting with at the time, and it was like 11 girls and me, and I thought, this is really good, this writing stuff. So it evolved into film. Wow. But I guess what happened. I've always been visual. My father was always into photography with a dark and face that. So I guess it all just sort of came together. Huh. Were, were there any movies uh, that you were influenced by? Well, at the different stages of my life were different influences. Like when I was a kid, it was the horror movies. Um, of the time, you know, Godzilla, or, or then I got older and it got more into the kind of um, English horror films like Something in the Pit. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole series, I forgot what it was now, about these little, little ant like creatures found in the subway in uh, London, in the tube station, and, and um, what was it, some guy's name? Anyway, I, 
got actually someone said that they thought I copied that for some movie. Mm -hmm. Thing man, and uh, I don't think I did. I kind of got influenced by Not a Living Dead from Elvis. It was a different movie. <laughs> but that's why he kind of wanders around, um, killing people, eating them, whatever. Are you ta are you, ta are you talking about them? No, it was the what, Crater Mass in the Pit, maybe. Oh, okay. Crater Mass movies, remember those? Yeah, Crater Mass, yeah. Yeah, I think it was that one. It's hard to remember, it was so long ago. And yeah, I just like the, I like for some reason the wild ones, the Marlon Brando or the motorcycles, and somehow that influenced me, maybe from <laughs> I don't know. That's a but great I movie. That was like the first movie I, I watched at the drive-in as opposed to whatever else you do with the drive -in. Wow, yeah, that's a good movie. So that one, and then I got into the Bellini and Benwell and the Surrealist. Um, mm -hmm. And the kind of, Bellini was a big influence of me. I actually met him. I was working in Rome in, uh, on some films, and uh, he was in the editing room next to me, and Antonioni was on the other side, and I was in the middle of two Italian genius director so it's kind of cool mm -hmm. so ha yeah. so life influenced me a lot too <laughs> yeah so, so how did you find the the door to filmmaking well i was which was kind of an interesting story i was in college taking business and i hated it and um, I found a book on how to hypnotize in the book in, in the bookstore in Cincinnati, actually, it was the University of Cincinnati. And I started doing it. I was hypnotizing kids in the dorm, and I had people walking around the campus with pins in their hands and stuff. And they told me to stop, and I didn't. And then um, I got one new guy, and I couldn't wake him up, so we had to go to the hospital for three days. And they said, wow. uh, you know, if, did you read the whole book? I said, yeah, no, just first chapters and how do you hypnotize and wake them up? And he said, well, if you read further, you say if they don't want to wake up. But he started shaking and it meant he was fighting waking up. They said he liked his life better hypnotizing his real life, this and that. So they said I should leave and come back in January and go to the art school. This was like October. I just started. So uh, I left and got bored. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I just went and joined the Air Force, the rule before Vietnam. And um, I got sent to London in the end. Uh, for three, three years, and I found out about the film school. I came back to college for a while in Maryland, in Richard, Maryland, and then I took a film course. And I see there was a graduate student who was the director, and he didn't seem to know what he was doing. It was obvious to me. So then I went to the film school that I heard about in London. And then I made three short films there. And that started me. Wow. And what, what you, one of your earliest movies uh, was There Is No 13. Um, I haven't seen it, but I but the concept sounds really awesome. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's a shame because what happened was um, – Everybody listen to this from Italy. <laughs> what was that? Do you have Italian listeners to <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I made the film, um, and then uh, I did the post-production in Italy. Mm -hmm. And the negative here, the storage place had the negative and prints and everything, went out of business and tossed everything for me and other films. And I don't have anything. All I have is a three-quarter inch tape of it from a print that's just pretty crappy. So I've been trying to find the negative, that, the inter-negative that's in Italy because uh, it was released in Italy because I got uh, the score there. And um, in, in Italy, if you, they pay for the music if it's released in Italy if you have a distribution deal. So if anybody wants to make a movie and you go to Italy and get them to do the music, it's free. And I got Rizzo Delani, who's one of the top composers Mm -hmm. I'm to do it. It's a great track. Anyway, I'm trying to find the element so I could release it. But it's all like and trashed, and I don't know. But it was it was an interesting film. It was very surrealistic. A lot of um, I guess influence.
influences from the Halimi and the Mall and things like that. I got a, it went to the Berlin Film Festival and um, it was tied to the Golden Bear. They were afraid to give it to me because it was an American film and people were protesting it because of Vietnam. And it was kind of an anti-war film. Mm-hmm. It's just they watched it, they'd see. Um, so they were afraid to give me the award and the judge gave me a prize. <laughs> he was the there and he gave me a book and he signed it and gave me a great review. But that's it. No one's really seen it. Yeah, was it autobiographical? Mm, possibly partly. <laughs> <laughs> More or less somewhere in there my brain attached to it. I don't know. But it was, it was a very kind of it's about the but I don't want to give it away in case I release it someday. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find the negative. So if anybody in Italy help me find it. Um, it was partially, I guess, about a filmmaker trying to make films and the frustrations of trying to get through people doing it and also finding a woman and, you know, the whole, I guess it's a common story taken to an extreme. Yeah, well, I hope you. I hope you get to release it someday. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get this piece together again. That's good. The same thing happened on my spooky house. Um, thing, the kids' film about a magician with Ben Kingsley, mm-hmm. and um, it, it, I had it distributed, and then the distribution company went into bankruptcy, and all my elements which they had or tied up the bankruptcy, all those videos and high def and everything else. I'm trying to get them back because I'm, I'm working on a, um, a re-release now. So actually a Facebook friend of yours, David Fine, yep. I'm working on the DVD. We're going to come out with a new DVD soon. And then next year, I do have the original negative and they have to make some stuff and deposit it. It's time. So we're going to try to do a 4K release. Oh, that's and good. Uh, it's always... A warning to filmmakers, keep control of your elements. Don't give them to them. Give them access to your place where you keep them. Don't let them out. Yeah. <laughs> That's the lesson I've learned twice. Wow. It's two times to learn the lesson. <laughs> yeah, it's back then, I mean, there was no resources for, you know, the business side like there is now. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of great cinematographers and directors have come out of there. It's like Michael Mann was there, Taki Fujimoto was I knew him when he was there when I was there. Who's Duncan uh, Demi's DP till he died. Anyway, um, they didn't teach anything anything about business. It was all creative and go make these wonderful movies. They didn't tell you you're going to get hit by lunatics trying to steal everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the hard part. It, it was just only the fantasy world of creativity. Maybe now they teach business stuff, but if I had known that, I would have been so innocent when I started dealing with people that really ripped you off like Credible Mounting Man and a giant piece of it. I've never seen a penny. Mm-hmm. The world is money. Galaxy is the same. So it's like, that's why, you know, I've started making my own movies and I'd rather not make it if I can't make it my way. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Go, go by my guy. If someone, if I'm trying to say yes what someone else wants, I can't talk to them, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's a good, that's a good, um, uh, system to have as a filmmaker, I think, to write your own stuff. Yeah. And it's Hollywood, the golden rule. I guess it's everything golden rule. He who has the gold rule. Yeah. Uh, that's an issue. Then you, uh, you did a couple documentaries, um, but after that uh, came The Incredible Melting Man, a classic movie. Where, where did you get the idea for it? My mother. <laughs> got this job working for a business that made um, paint, spray paints, and there was this gel stuff or gloppy, gluey stuff. She brought it to me in a jar. So I came and went to see her, and she had this stuff in a jar, and said, this stuff's great, you should make a movie. <laughs> and there's all this gooey, that's how there's a melting man. Wow. 
it, it kind of reminds me of a um, human condition metaphor along the lines of like David Cronenberg type type of uh, body horror stuff. Well, it's kind of like aging, really, isn't it? Yeah, aging. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can get too descriptive when I when I write screenplays as well. I, I just you want to like put everything that comes in your head on paper, you know. Yeah, so people know what's in your head. Mm-hmm. You know, like, which is okay, I guess they can have their own vision. And if I'm directing, it doesn't matter. It's going to be what's on my head, whether it's written down or not. Mm-hmm. And you gave you gave Jonathan Demi a role in it. That was like during his his Roger Corman days, right? Yeah, it was, it was friends with the producers, and um, he gets killed. <laughs> that's 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 so terrible to say now. <laughs> yeah. And also uh, Janice Blythe from The Hills Have Eyes. I met her uh, a couple of years ago at a convention. She is very interesting, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I actually was at a convention with her a couple of years ago in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And um, um, we were on a panel together. She's great. Yeah. She did a good job. I made her go catatonic, and she was great. <laughs> I was auditioning people, making you know, be catatonic. She was terrific at it <laughs> oh that's great and uh you also had uh, young rick baker do special effects he he was coming yeah, yeah. he was coming off of the exorcist um working with dick smith on that uh had he done star wars yet Chris Wayless, yeah. And then uh, you further showed versatility with the teen comedy Van Nuys Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun one. That was, they came to me and they said, we want to make a movie about cruising on Van Nuys Boulevard. And I was into cars and things to quit. When I was a kid, cruise and stuff. And uh, I got all excited about that. I wrote the script in seven days or something and we shot it. Less than a month later, it was in the theaters for three months because they wanted to capitalize on the craze. Yeah, this was like right after Animal House and right before Porky's. It was the whole one. They were afraid the Van Nuys Boulevard crew 
limousine would stop, which it did after the movie because it got so crowded that the police closed it down. People were coming from Japan in taxis to cruise and things after the movie. So uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, Van Nuys Boulevard again because there's a band called The Wild Cherry. Mm-hmm. And the drives by on the street. It wasn't anything we did. And um, someone found it online about like, maybe a year ago or less and got it, brought it home, rebuilt the whole thing. And there was a whole big van caravan to Van Nuys Boulevard. You can see it all online. It's a lot about it because now the original owner of the van says he stole it and it was like abandoned. <laughs> so now they're fighting over it. But I went there and there was a whole band procession across the country and ended up on Van Ness Boulevard and they cruised. It was cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the movie has great scenery of what L.A. was back then. Yeah. I like that movie. Some movies, you know, are fun, more fun to make and some are torture. That was a fun one. <laughs> Uh, Cynthia Wood, who was in Playboy, uh, was in it, and uh, Melissa Prophet. Uh, were they good to work with? Yeah, it was great. Everybody, it was like a fun time. The whole thing was fun. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody had a good time making it. And it was like a party, almost. And there was a lot of hours and not a long shooting schedule. The same as Melting Man, it was a little longer than that. It was 18 or 20 days. But it was just, you know, it was a good Uplift thing, and the movie's kind of uplifting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Then comes the movie you'll probably always be remembered for, Galaxina. Yes. Well, I'm working writing the sequel to it. Really? Right now. Yeah, I'm getting the rights back in 2020, so I'm going to do um, either two people have come to me and said it'd be a good TV comedy. And then uh, some people say, no, I should do it as a movie. So I'm kind of writing in a scene where it's in best. So uh, there's also uh, another one I'm working on, kind of like Melting Man, a little different. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have a third one I'm working on. I've been, I kind of stopped making movies because I only want to do them when I can control them, but I've been writing and I'm working on getting a thing to it all together to make start making them again, but only on my conditions, or I won't do them. Yeah, that is, is there is there a particular actress you have in mind today who could play Galaxina? No, I want to do as part of it. I want to do a nationwide search for the new Galaxina. Huh. I want it to be part of the. Um, it was so hard to find Dorothy. I mean, I looked at, I'd say, hundreds of thousands of actresses here, and they were all, something about them, they were all kind of, I'd say that they were the same. <laughs> they different, different versions of the same. Yeah. And they were wonderful ones, really. I, I don't know if she knows it, but my second choice was Connie Selica. Remember her? Yep. Greatest American Hero. The commercial with the hair dryers and stuff. And yep. then there was uh, some famous model, Patty Hansen. Mm-hmm. Um, they were they were the only other ones I was really considering. And but then when Dorothy Stratton walked into the office, and it, we, we were kind of in the back. You had to walk through a lot of a secretarial pool, a lot of people working at desks. Mm-hmm. And we've been seeing women walk through this for months. Part of it was in a casting office, and part of it was in Crown's office. And when she started, I was out there in the, with everybody else when she came in and she walked through and everybody stopped working and that was the first time that ever happened. Mm-hmm. Well, hundreds of girls that came in or women um, and they just stopped working because she was, it was like something with an aura around came in or something. Yeah. So, uh, that was... She was wearing a semi-transparent top and that with her heels she was like over 16 feet tall. <laughs> that might have had something to do with it, but but it was you know I knew right then that was it. Yeah, that, that was such a tragedy with her, you know. It was that was the day the movie opened too. 
yeah, it opened on my birthday, and I I was three years away from being born. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy birthday! Thank you. <laughs> was was the movie influenced by Barbarella? Mm, movie was influenced by everything. Uh, sci-fi movie I've ever seen. <laughs> it was a spoof on sci-fi movies, but I don't know the Barbarella. Uh, did that come before Ford Galatina? Do you know? Yeah, 68. Oh, okay, then maybe it was, but not intentionally. But I took, I just took everything from every sci-fi movie and spoofed it. Like the title, or the, you know, the Star Wars titles, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just a spoof of sci-fi, like Melting Man was a spoof of horror movies. Mm-hmm. Me, I don't know anybody else, but to me it was. I like doing that. I like kind of spoofing them things. Yeah. So it, I mean, it maybe the influence, but I don't know if it was the only one. Yeah. I consciously say I'm going to copy Barbarella. Yeah. I copy. I'm copying everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was in the middle of the of the uh, science fiction craze at that time. Has it ever really died out, science fiction? Well, it, it it shifted. It became darker once James Cameron came into the equation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of like things to be fun. Like Melting Man is to me a comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm making the movie, they're seeing the dailies, and they're saying, well, this, is, this isn't serious. I said, no. I said, they said, it's a, it's a, I said, it's a spoof, it's a comedy a horror. And they said, but we want a serious one. And I said, did you read the script? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, spoiler ending, you know, that's not serious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that's that sequel sees the light of day. Yeah, it's not really a sequel. It's different, but it's a version of it. Mm-hmm. I don't own the rights to that, so I have to do something different. But this is different enough. <laughs> and it's, again, it's it's kind of freaky. It's fun. I'm having fun right I actually stopped writing the. Galaxina sequel because I can't do that till 2020 anyway when the copyright reverts. But I can uh, do this other one sooner, so I'm working on that now. I'm kind of taking elements that I've written for Galaxina and putting them in this one too. So it's, it's fun. I'm having fun with it. Problem is, life gets in the way of writing. Yeah. Like running, looking for a dog. <laughs> you know things like. That. Yeah. It's like it's like writing a book. You know. I'm trying that. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I kind of go from one thing to the other, depending on what I feel like at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's like with movies, I try not to do, like some people only do horror movies. I can't do that. I've done it. I want to do something different, and I'll come do another one later. Yeah. I, can't, I don't want to only, only, only do the same thing, because it gets boring. Mm-hmm. How, how did you get to uh, write and produce uh, Exterminator 2? Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I got out of um, film school, I went to San Francisco for a while. That's where I'm from. Money for a movie, and it only ended up being enough for a short, which we did. And I worked there a little bit, and I started finding out that I worked for a company called Imagination Incorporated, and the guy, his name was Bob Godfrey, and he got, I think he got an Oscar for The Masked Man, which is an animated film about Lenny Bruce. Mm-hmm. Or from the Lenny Bruce comedy thing, but I worked there cleaning toilets. <laughs> that was my first film job. So uh, it's kind of they trained me as assistant editor. I cleaned the toilets. I worked as a PA for a while. Mm-hmm. Then I started hearing that a film I made in film school was getting famous, and I thought, "Oh, I'm getting famous because it was Kill Breakfast, and it was in the." Um, uh, like 25 festivals that won prizes in and it was put in the archives of the British
British Film Institute, we're still there. So I said, I had to get to London, but I had no money. And I was in San Francisco, and I had a friend that was driving to Mexico. For some reason, I figured that'll help me get to London. So I went with him and his wife, and a little bunch of adventures in Mexico. Anyway, I got to New York from Mexico, and um, I wanted to... Uh, figure out how to get to London, so I got out of the subway. This is the first time I ever, when I arrived in New York, and I walked into the first building, and I looked to see if there were any film companies there. I had my little 35 millimeter print of the breakfast, the short. Mm-hmm. So I saw one company had two floors. It was Canon. Oh. So I went to Canon, and I parked my film on this desk in the reception room, and uh, I said, I just made this film that won all these prizes, and can you uh, give me a job? It turned out the reception room was really the whole office. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was an editing room on another floor, and they said, well, we need someone to drive the dailies back and forth from the lab from this location, and the actors back and forth, which was on Long Island, Sag Harbor. Mm-hmm. It was a film starring a new guy named De Niro. <laughs> So I drove the stuff back and forth, and and uh, they started tri- working. I started working on that film and another film as the assistant editor in the one editing room, and it was, uh, somebody named George Norris, who was a great editor, really was. Anyway, um, and he taught me a lot. And then another film I was working on as the assistant editor had lots of problems. They fired the director; they didn't know what to do. So they said, "Well, here." I said, I know what to do. Shoot three days of this and that. And they made me the director. <laughs> I got promoted from assistant editor to director on the same movie. And I fixed that. It was south of Hell Mountain. And they gave me co-producer, co-director credit, which I didn't want. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so then they started keeping me to fix all their films. And this was not the Israeli that owned Canon. It was guys from New York. Mm-hmm. And later, they sold Canon to the Israelis, to Menachem and Galan and Jerome Golfus. But anyway, yeah. um, that's how I got connected. It's starting to connect to the Exterminator, too, which I'll get you. But I started fixing all their movies, and the one with De Niro was so bad, and the director was so rude to us. Like that with De Niro, we decided, no, we didn't want to fix his movie. <laughs> <laughs> Short version. 
yeah, I, I think it's as good as the original. And I always thought that Robert Ginty was a very underrated actor. He was great. And you know what happened? When I came to the set the first time to direct, mm-hmm. this was the second time this happened. The actors wouldn't come out of the motorhome if the director was there. It mm-hmm. happened on The Servants of Twilight as well. Bruce Greenwood wouldn't come out. And both times I totally agreed with them because they're made to look stupid. <laughs> so I went to Ginty. I said, he's gone. You know, I'm doing it. And he just wouldn't come out. He just didn't want to come out of the room. He said, no, it's awful. So I said, I'll tell you what, the scene, you can direct it. So he, like, ran out the door. <laughs> and the scene where he's crawling around next to the garbage truck was directed by Ginty. <laughs> and he was great. We got to be friends. And then he became a director before he passed away doing a lot of TV. Oh, yeah. I remember. Well, he was a really good actor. I liked him a lot. It's a shame. Yeah. It also had Mario Van Peebles and, the, and Ari Gross. Well, Mario Van Peebles was kind of like just a random gang member. Mm-hmm. The first part. And then when I had to reshoot my stuff, Dizzy wasn't available. Mm-hmm. doing another movie. I think David Winters was directing it, and they wanted like thirty or fifty thousand dollars to release him for a few days from my shoot. And Cannon was freaking out. So, so you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I'll, I'll save it without him. And um, <laughs> that's where I came up with the idea of the clothing mask and the plane girl. because you didn't need to see his face until this one shot that was in the first part where he lifts up his mask. Mm-hmm. The welding mask, and you see it's Ginty. So I tied that in that one shot and used the everybody stuntmen or whoever wanted to do it running around in a mask. And the <laughs> flamethrower was taken from the he was welding on the truck in that shot from a welding thing, and I turned the little welding thing into flamethrower, which became the whole movie. Basically. Yeah, so the, the, that wasn't in the original. Wow. And as far as Harry Gross. He auditioned, and he had this, like, great way of talking, like, nasally. Yeah. You know, this is great. You know, so I gave him the part. He comes to shoot, and his voice isn't like that. I said, well, what's wrong? What happened? You had this great voice. That's why I gave him the part. He said, I had a cold. <laughs> so I think we stuffed cotton in his nose or something after that. <laughs> but he was great. So, and he, he's a good guy. Oh, uh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> that was a story. Then, then you did, then you did Hot Chili. Was that, uh, was that your attempt at another Van Nuys Boulevard? No, that was, it started to be, Menachem Galan wanted to do another Lemon Popsicle movie, which was popular in Israel. Oh, yeah. And he said, do this, do that. So I started writing this, he said, we write it together. Okay. <laughs> and um, I worked at his house and I worked at, in the office with him and I saw the craziness around him and kind of craziness while we're doing the script. And he's coming up with these, he says, I have this great idea. Write it down. I'm sitting there with the yellow pad and he goes off about something. And I wrote something else because it was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we go down the shoot. I don't know if you've ever read the script, but he's, we go down to Mexico to shoot. Yeah. Get a phone call three days later. There's nothing here that I hope. Because he saw the dailies we sent back. It was all changed from <laughs> what he did. So he said, I'm coming. Stop shooting. So we partied for three days. And uh, then he came down and he did his scenes. I did my scenes and they all got put together. And I don't like the movie. And But he said, Something like Burt Lancaster said it was his favorite movie. I don't know. It was this crazy mishmash of his ideas and my ideas. And I don't, that's when I started realizing, you know, I can't do this. I got to do what I want to do. <laughs> some people, you know, it's weird. I was going to take my name off it because mm-hmm. and, and, I didn't like it at all. And um, I called the director's guild. And they said, you know, if you take your name off, you don't get residuals. Oh, all right, I'll leave it off. And I made more money in residuals from that movie than any other one. <laughs> so I guess a lot of people like it. I don't know. It's crazy that some of the stuff I like, my stuff, not his stuff. 
Yeah. That's and, what happened. <laughs> and uh, Joe Rubo, he was coming off of uh, The Last American Virgin at Canon. Yeah, he does. I, I reached out to him for an interview. Hopefully, I'll get it soon. But uh, he's good. I like him. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's he's a really funny guy too. Yeah, yeah. No, he's like in shape now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how did you get to co-produce uh, Leprechaun? Same thing. I got a phone call and at night. I was at a restaurant. Come tomorrow morning. The It's amazing how that franchise became successful because it was this low-budget home video franchise. Well, it was so bad, I turned it down. Actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm confused. That was the servants of Twilight that I, they called me the night before to come. On Leprechaun, um, I, they sent me a tape of it, the VHS of what it was, and it was the most horrible thing I ever saw. They said, <laughs> the third one the best when he's in Las Vegas but I did not watch any of the others I had nothing to do yeah uh, I, I recommend the third one if you ever do uh, so so you said uh, uh, you, you pretty much quit move, uh, making movies after uh, Spooky House and stuff but you're working on uh, some others now the Galaxina <laughs> reboot I kind of said oh, I'm going to retire and I'm writing a lot and then now I'm getting the itch to make another movie. <laughs> you can't escape it. It's like a disease. It's like an addiction. Yeah. It's the, I was going to write novels. And then I have had trouble writing novels because I think they're too visual. Yeah. Um, you know, I keep starting them and changing them and doing something else and, and playing around with it. But um, I'm starting, I think now I'll get back to the movie stuff. So that's why I'm working on these scripts. And I traveled around, and I did this and that. I did, I did other stuff and commercials, and you know, I didn't stop doing anything and PSAs and things like that. But I didn't really want to make a, a movie, and I did some fixing and some stuff. So um, I fixed over twenty-five movies. Yeah. Mostly, I can't talk about them, so I don't want people to know they're in trouble because they have these ghosts. I just the <laughs> movie for the trouble. No one will want to watch it. Yeah, it's a, it's a completely different world now in, in film because everything now is, you know, film festivals and trying to get the movie picked up because all the independent film companies, they went south. Yeah, yeah, now it's mostly like Netflix television. Yeah. That's why people are telling me to do Galaxy for television, which could work. I can see that. But I don't know. I, uh, it's, I'm kind of making her into a superhero. <laughs> Why not? She's a robot, right? Yeah. Or like some sort of robot, partial or whatever. <laughs> and, um, so she could do anything, right? Yeah. Well, how do you think? What would you like to see? Is it? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see her, you know, advance in, in the future, you know, as a robot, as a superhero, you know, anything, really. I mean... You know, it's it's all comes from your head, man. I mean, I think. <laughs> I'm just curious as an audience. What would you like? Yeah, I think I, I think. One person now here. <laughs> yeah, you you would be. I have to tell you, the audience was always important, obviously. But when I did Spooky House, 
I had complete control. I had final cut. I had everything else. It was my movie. I raised the money. I, I produced it. I distributed it. I did everything, um, which made me want to stop making movies because I was doing business stuff, which is how I started in college in business school, which I hated, and that's why I left and hypnotized cut. Anyway, um, but I, I had a screening before it was final cut for kids. And yeah. Then, Little kids, you know, from five years old, 12 or something, because that's who the movie target audience was, four to 12, actually. So anyway, so I, I had these kids there, and I showed them the movie, and I said, and they're all sitting there in the audience, it's very cute. And I said to them, okay, I want to see you taking this scene out with the bullies. And so a little girl in a pink dress, like seven, six, seven years old, stood up and said, no, you can't, because if you take that out, we won't hate them and like it when they get them. <laughs> I left it in. So I still did that final cut. Oh, wow. Final cut. <laughs> that's crazy. But that's what's fun about making movies, you know? Mm hmm. Absolutely. You never know what's going to happen when you make them. No. It's all kind of. A producer I worked for once said making movies like trying to. I don't know if you said punch or grab. <laughs> That's what it is. It's like this amorphous thing floating around. You have to shape it into something and it moves away when the hand comes in and stuff. Do you still uh, do conventions? I've done some. Every once in a while. But I don't. I love going. I love meeting the people. Mm-hmm. I don't like. I, I don't like. Signing things and getting paid to sign them. Yeah. It's like weird. Why should I get money to sign my name? I, I hate that. So I don't go to many. But then maybe that's silly because then you can't go. <laughs> you don't do that. But it, it's like, I don't know. But I really enjoy them. So yeah. The last one was that one I saw Dennis Blythe in, in um, Cleveland, which was, I had a great time. I'd like to maybe go back. I don't know. That's the whole thing about it. It's weird. Yeah, the, I know it's, everybody does it, but most of me. Yeah, I did. I, I started going to conventions two years ago, and uh, already the, the, everyone's prices just you know get higher and higher every year. And yeah, I I I, I know wh why this happened. It's partly because of you know the collectors that sell on eBay, and it's partly because. Back in the '90s, the uh, the sports athletes were doing that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, my cousin used to go to a lot of them. He died, but Paul Smith mm -hmm. he was in Dean in Midnight Express. Mm -hmm. he used to do a lot of them. He's my cousin. <laughs> was, um, but you know, he did a lot of them. So then I started. But years ago, when Melting Man came out, and I went to, to Comic Con with them. And I've gone to a few every now and then. I'd go to another one, I guess. But uh, it's also a pain to fly there. And really to, <laughs> I'm trying to write. But maybe if a good one came along, I'd go. Yeah, that would be great. Well, well, sir, this has been such an honor. And I thank you so much for taking your time today. And I hope uh, we get to meet at a convention or a festival one day. Uh, I'm going to one in Sacramento, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Uh, I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> Enjoy it. I don't know. Maybe I'll go to another one. But that's my problem with them, although I think the rest of it is great fun. Yeah. Well, it's a good time to the conversation. Oh, my pleasure. You, you have yourself a, a great evening, sir. Oh, it's, it, I, I, I never had the, the dog reason, but I've had a lot of people be, be late because of uh, things happening, so you're not the first one. <laughs> well, as long as you tape it, you play it when you want. <laughs> if it was live, everybody's waiting for the dog to be found. It would be maybe exciting. Uh, then I would narrate it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Thanks for wanting me to do this. My pleasure. Thanks, William. Have a great day. Bye. Well, there you have.
have it. William Sachs. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, William. You're a funny guy. You tell great stories about about the way the film industry used to be. And you're very humble. And you're not bitter. And I thank you so much, sir. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.